and then immediately we flew to Miami to do some work start getting ready for the candidates should we say that are we are we allowed to to disclose that welcome back everybody to another episode of the c squared podcast it's been a while it's been a very busy start to 2024 uh fabi we haven't talked since the world rapid and blitz we had a couple of episodes uh, dropping a uh, very interesting one with mvl a very fun one with james uh, conti uh, but right now we're finally back together and we do have a lot to talk about because a lot of things have been happening in the chess world there's the big tournament happening right now tata still will chat about that in just a second and a lot of other things but uh, first things first, uh, happy New Year's, happy uh, 2024. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, what, in fact, we've been doing uh, to start off the year. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, happy New Year. Uh, I mean, it's been a while <laughs> since the New Year uh, struck, but yeah, I guess we haven't recorded something in quite a while. I mean, we had yeah, we as you mentioned, the big um, uh, Champions Chess Tour. Everyone got together, and when we spoke to Maxime, we spoke to Canty. Those were fun. Two uh, two great guys in the chess world. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting talks with them for sure. I mean, uh, it's there's always a lot of stuff going on going on in the chess world, as as you know, right? It's nonstop events. There's obviously a big one going on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so Todd Steele, mm -hmm. but there's all sorts of online events as always. Uh, there was a World Rapid and Blitz, so Magnus won both of those. Kind of incredible achievement uh, again, as he repeated last year. Actually, let's and, uh, review those. Um, tell us a bit about your experience at the Rapid and Blitz. How was the venue? I saw you were uh, uh, doing some photo shoots uh, at the start of the event, you visiting uh, the town with Levon. Uh, I think it was uh, big on social media at some point. How did you enjoy the experience overall? Because obviously there were, there were, there were all these talks about going or not going to Uzbekistan. Yeah, I finally decided to go even after all my talk and probably looked silly to people, all my talk about how it was so difficult to get there. It was difficult to get there, but I, I did uh, find a way to cut up the trip in a way which made me feel as though I could manage it. And uh, of course, I just wanted to play because it's a big event, right? Yeah. It's a big chance to uh, to win a world championship. I mean, not, not the main world championship, let's say, but still a very important achievement. Those who have managed to win over the years obviously value that very highly. And those who haven't are trying. So I've gotten silver medal and bronze medal, but I've never gotten the gold medal. And of course, I was trying to do that. This time, I didn't get close in either one. Unfortunately, it was it was all a bit up and down, uh, a, a bit too up and down. And yeah, I didn't really ever uh, stay at the top. So I, mm. I managed to, at the end, get near the top, but not really to stay there consistently throughout in the way that you have a chance at medals. And Magnus in the Rapid was, uh, well, you can't really fault him for anything. I mean, he just basically was the clear leader from start to finish. It was um, it was a very smooth performance. And uh, and in the Blitz, it was a bit less clear cut, but still he managed to pull through in the end and pretty solidly without even needing a tiebreak. So for me, it was um, slightly disappointing, I have to say. I at least wanted to fight for medals. You know, if you get a medal, you have a pretty good emotion. Like last time I got the bronze medal in the rapid. It wasn't like uh, the biggest thrill ever, but it was. I was pretty uh, satisfied with at least the rapid. Blitz was very up and down. I'm talking about 2022. And uh, this time I didn't even have that, that like little boost from getting third place or second place. Mm -hmm. And okay, there. My tournament was unremarkable compared to everything else that happened. Besides Magnus winning, of course, there was this very, very famous uh, Jan Napomnishi and Daniel Dubov game. The Dance of the Knights, yes. Yeah, which ended in a, a double forfeit. Very rare occurrence. Mm -hmm. uh, not unprecedented. It was something that you could actually expect. 
uh, because I, I, I've seen other examples of this, not at the very highest level, but two players play a game which is decided by whoever is in charge, which is very often the arbiters. I think it usually is the arbiters who make this decision that the game uh, kind of puts chess into disrepute or whatever their ter their terminology is for for this. But basically what happens is they decide that the players have um, not respected the game and therefore don't get uh, the point that is usually shared in a chess game. And that's what happened. It was actually pretty potentially, you could argue, uh, important for the tournament standings because if you look at the final standings, well, uh, wasn't Dubov, Dubov was like place. half a point behind Magnus? Basically, in the final standings, half a point in the was, final standings. Yeah. yeah, of course, you can definitely say, well, you know, the tournament goes entirely differently, right? Of course. It's, I mean, it's that wasn't the end of the tournament. Like that wasn't the last round. So all sorts of things could have happened, could have changed depending on that game. But yeah, if you look at the final standings, it's a pretty important half point. Yeah. Um, I mean, what happened was they kind of uh, agreed to this sort of night, um, the silly night dance, which is, uh, it's, it, it's, they said it's a protest uh, sort of against the conditions, uh, against the fact that there was like a one hour plus delay. Yeah. Due to a totally ridiculous thing. I mean, Andrew Hong was playing Yu Yang Yi, and uh, I, this is just like the, the reason for the delay. Mm -hmm. And Hong uh, made a move, pressed the clock, but apparently didn't press it hard enough, and his time ran out because he didn't realize that the clock actually actually didn't start for his opponent. It stayed on his, it stayed running for him. And then he claimed that he had pressed the clock, and he filed an appeal. This was all dealt with during the round, so I mean during the the middle of the uh, the tournament day, so. Everyone was left waiting for like an hour. There's not much you can do about it. I mean, I think it should have been handled faster because, um, I mean, with all due respect to Andrew, and I, I think he's a nice guy, and I know him a little bit, uh, and it's nothing wrong with filing an appeal if you think that you're uh, in the right. But, I mean, unless there's like some video evidence that he, he absolutely did press the clock and there was a malfunction which there wasn't then you have to just like rule against him very quickly yeah yeah no absolutely because he actually ran out of time so that that that's my take on it uh okay the players were a little bit annoyed dubov and nepo decided to um to make this little protest which whatever it's it's their choice if they want to make a protest um but i i don't think it was very effective mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't really see the the benefit from this like uh, hey you're protesting something it's not exactly clear what you're protesting that they took too long for an appeal protesting that magnus got a private room uh or or something like that but this is obviously not going to have any positive effect it's just a distraction from everything right mm -hmm. if you want to protest you just say okay these things were wrong and i'm uh sort of complaining officially about it and so on you know yeah anyway not yeah, no. Um, well, I actually talked to Andrew and he was making his case that the clock malfunctioned. I mean, this is a world championship. You should have the measures in place to check these things quickly. I understand there's a lot of boards and it would require quite some resources to, let's say, put cameras on all of the boards. But I mean, I'm sure you can fund... I don't know, feed they can fund, especially for this tournament. And, you know, they can take it from one year to the other. Um, I don't know, buy a few webcams and put it next to each and every board. I'm sure it would um, even turn a profit for them by simply uh, showing the games later on on their YouTube. You know, things, uh, very simple things that can be implemented and that can um, just eliminate this type of protests and this type of uh, situations altogether. It would be very easy to just watch it on camera, see whether it malfunctioned. Because I've seen clocks that malfunction, actually. I've seen clocks that if they don't have enough battery, sometimes they don't record um, the move or they just simply turn off. A lot of things, a lot of uh, times uh, clocks have turned off in the middle of the game and then you have to kind of gauge, okay, how much time did I have? How much time do you remember we had? If you don't have a camera going on, then you're not going to be able to be precise. So yes, especially 
due to the fact that it's such an important event, I, I feel like we should have these measures um, in place. We have them for all the private events. We have them for, you know, uh, the GCT events or, you know, the Champions Chess Tour events. There's always going to be a camera pointed at uh, the board. But at the same time, you know, there's uh, fewer boards in the World Championship. Uh, there's like, what, 150 boards? Like, how many players were there? I, to be honest, I don't, I don't remember exactly how many boards there were. Quite a but, few. Yeah, it's quite a few. Quite a quite few. A yeah, it, it's it's an investment, but I feel like it, it should be done, especially given, you know, uh, let's say the propensity for these things to happen, especially in Blitz and Rapid. Yeah, in Blitz and Rapid, anything can happen. It's not like it's anyone's fault. You know, obviously, Yuangi wasn't at fault. Hong was just arguing his case. Mm -hmm. As I wouldn't have done it personally because I would think, okay, it's a half point, and then you waste an hour energy, and it's in the middle of the tournament. It's not like at the end when maybe you're fighting for medals. It's like right in the middle and half point isn't probably going to change your tournament too much because you'll play someone a bit weaker and then you're more likely to get a full point. And so I would have uh, just accepted the decision and moved on. That would be, but I understand if you want to fight it, especially if it's a matter of principle to you, you think you're right. Okay, that's that's your choice as well. Yeah. But anyway, that was, um, I mean, there was all, all sorts of little things during the world championship that people were talking about. Nothing, I think, too major. Like we talked about the whole Magnus Prime mm -hmm. Room, mm -hmm. and whatever. Yeah, it's yeah those things were big deal. more or less covered. Where did you spend New Year's? Well, I, I went to visit my my parents for a little bit after okay. that. That's why I, I mentioned I kind of found a way to split the trip, yeah. while also seeing my family for a bit. So it kind of made sense. It was still a long trip, but it uh, it definitely made a lot more sense for me like that. Yeah, seeing you. And then I came back. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah no i'm I, i'm feeling old every time we were getting the new year celebration i remember you know staying up until like 5 6 a.m in the morning and partying when i was i don't know 20 and now i barely make it to midnight uh midnight new year's go to sleep type of thing so yeah. uh i guess uh yeah the world is changing in some regard but anyway good start 2024 at least for me uh, we played the pan americans um big intercollegiate event mizu won it um so this was a big deal obviously with the program being created only like a few years back and now we finally winning the pan amps uh it was a big moment and then immediately we flew to miami to do some work start getting ready for the candidates should we say that are we are we allowed to to disclose that uh yeah i think so why not <laughs> well no, i mean we yeah we everyone's training for the candidates that's obvious so everyone who's playing is uh, nobody's going to uh to skimp is that the word i'm not sure skirt? skimp i've never train. heard that word that's an interesting one okay Let's skimp. Look it up. <laughs> skimp expand or use less. yeah yeah that's a word that's, I'm, that's I'm, a nice I'm word right. that's a nice Spend word or use less time okay money or material yeah no <laughs> nobody's gonna uh skip out you could say on their on their training or at least they shouldn't okay so I, i've noticed that um i mean i've already played like many candidates so i've trained for many candidates and uh, I've noticed the difference in my training over the years. And, okay, I don't think it's, like, too much of a secret what I can show. Like, also, you know, Magnus posted his training for a world championship. Like, you, you basically saw um, exactly what they were doing, which is probably what most people do. Which this is that you this was after, after the world championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was um, It was actually what we were supposed to do, except that ours got released during the world championship. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That, but that was actually what we were planning. Like, they at some point filmed our like training, and they were like, "Okay, it'll be released a few months after the World Championship," you know. And then it got released during, so that was maybe not um, ideal. Yeah. But we saw Magnus. It was like PH is there, Dubov is there, uh, Fresenay, Lauren Fresenay is there, um, Jordan. Who else? Jordan. Uh, and they're all kind of lounging around on sofas with their laptops, and then they look for some ideas, then they play blitz games to test their ideas. Magnus plays a lot of blitz games, they get lunch outside, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's that's basically what P 
people do. I mean, it's it's a bunch of guys who look for ideas on their computer and then test them out to see if they uh, are challenging to face over the board. And then a lot of Blitz games because people just find that fun and enjoy playing Blitz. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what trading uh, very often is. Yeah, and I so, feel there's slight differences, obviously. Um, I, I think... Um... Nepo was talking about his camp at some point and he was mentioning that it was very, you know, professional. Um, now, Magnus' camp obviously was also geared very much towards uh, sports. Uh, let's say we know that he likes to play sports. Um, we sort of tried to maintain some sort of a balance as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I actually get in better shape when I'm at home. Because when I'm at home, I can maintain a very, very strict routine mm-hmm. and like a very relatively heavy training regimen. Like I can work out every day and I can also, I just have like more time. I don't have to to balance uh, out like managing multiple people's work. It is time consuming and also working myself. Mm-hmm. I can take a bit more relaxed approach. So uh, when you're at a training camp, it's nice to play sports. Uh, so we try to do that, but I, I would say my training is less intensive than when I'm at home and can actually get into the gym and like, uh, do some heavy because, okay, I have the equipment at home. Yeah. I don't have the equipment when I'm on the road necessarily. It's much harder to find a really good gym and it's also time consuming because, you know, you might, you have to drive to the gym, you have to drive back and so on. Um, and nutrition is kind of an issue when you're traveling because it's much harder to, to get, um, uh, like everything that you would have at home, like cooking for yourself and, and all, all that. And also you have to deal with uh, like multiple people. So everyone has their own needs. Yeah. That's uh, actually so... a big problem for uh, for me whenever traveling. And I'm trying to find ways to optimize for that. Uh, it's a very silly word that I try to not use too often, but it is optimization, especially when traveling. It's, it's sort of like you f- have to find the routine on the go. Like you, you get there and you, within a day or two maximum, you need to find a routine that works with you and that, you know, uh, maximizes your health benefits as well. Because like even if you're eating at the best restaurants, you're still going to eat with a lot of salt, with a lot of taste. It's not going to be super healthy food, even if you're eating like the, at the best restaurants. So it's, it's a very, very tricky um, problem to solve. Yeah, well, I, for me, it's like restaurants, I don't mind. I know it's not the healthiest, but that's that's kind of my secondary concern. Mm-hmm. It just mostly I want to like have an abundance of food mm-hmm. and that's nutritious. And if there is like a little bit too much salt or sugar, um, I mean, you can call it a cheat meal or whatever you want to call it, but uh, it's better than not having nu- nutrition, right? If you're having like kind of dirty nutrition, it's better than not having it at all, which would be my main concern. Which I is don't that. know, actually. You, you eat a lot. Food. You eat a lot. That's true. You eat a lot. That's that's just my perspective. Like I, everyone, I think, will have a different perspective on this, especially since everyone has their own goals. Uh, and also depending on their body type and their weight, they might have different goals. Like I'm, I'm at a very low weight mm-hmm. uh, and I always have been. So my goals are not um, to lose weight mm-hmm. uh, and not to like be super clean. Like I'll be super clean at home. And, uh, and that's, I mean, that's, that's easy when you're at home. When mm-hmm. you're on the road, it's hard to be super clean, uh, as you mentioned, because you might have to go to restaurants. Yeah. And at restaurants, you can't control anything. You don't you don't know, know what they're cooking with. You don't know their oil. You don't know the amount of salt they're using, as you mentioned, uh, the amount of sugar they use. Obviously, at a restaurant, like their goal is to make the food taste good. Exactly. So taste is not really necessarily correlated to health. <laughs> like, taste very often is uh, is correlated to stuff that might not be so healthy. But, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. Uh, but okay, so going back to like training, my first time training for candidates was in 2016. And this was by far, because I was the first candidate I played, my, by far my um, least professional training camp. Okay. By like a huge margin. It was like one week, maybe a bit longer, I don't know, maybe eight days, maybe nine days, with Rustam Kazimjanov, uh, with Lawrence Trent, <laughs> and we invited one, uh, Lawrence was my manager at the time, uh-huh. and we invited one guy who um, was not part of like the main team, but very strong player, Maxime Bushlogrov. 
Oh, MVL was there. I don't think I've ever heard about that. Uh, or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I've said it, but okay, it's not a secret, mm. obviously. Okay. Uh, and our prep, if you want to even call it prep, was from what I remember looking for some ideas in the anti Berlin, which I actually used in the second round against Anish, our big idea. I, I, we, we missed one move because engines weren't so strong, which he played over the board and immediately got a better position. <laughs> it was a move F6 in some position. People who are interested can look up the game. Uh, F6, <laughs> black is slightly better. That was the end of our prep. So whatever we spent there, like immediately refused over the board by Anish. Then we prepared some lines of the Grunfeld. I actually played one line against Anish again. The famous game where I was down four pawns and mm -hmm. somehow drew the game. Mm -hmm. I remember that. At some point, just like plus five out of the opening. So that was our other prep. Um, dead loss out of the opening. And our other big thing that we were preparing was the Benoni. I don't think we really looked at any variations. I think I just played Blitz games against Maxime and the Benoni. And we decided that this was sufficient prep to play in the Kansas. <laughs> okay, this is really bad. And I played in one game against Levon and somehow drew that game as well, uh, despite getting probably a losing position out of the opening or close to it. And I don't remember doing much else besides going to the beach a lot and playing a lot of Blitz games against Maxime. And what else? I don't... Quite. Also playing some Blitz games against Lawrence, which uh, is fun, and uh, and watching movies. That was, but somehow it, it wasn't so bad. It worked out okay. Like I almost won the the Kansas like that. Solid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Solid. Obviously, you, you remember twenty eighteen Kansas prep. That was more serious. <laughs> I'm trying to re ah, we we had it in Miami, right? Um, yeah, that was fairly serious. We played some sports, but not that much. Um. Uh, we went like once. We, we didn't twice. play any sports. I mean, we were playing in the backyard with like the ball. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally. we were jogging. We were jogging. We were jogging as well. Um, yeah, and then I think we went a couple of times at the beach, or maybe just once. Um, oh yeah, I got horribly sunburned. Yes, um, I think all of us. I, I didn't. Somehow I didn't realize. Oh yeah, over the years I kind of realized that uh, you probably should respect the sun, <laughs> but. At the time, I thought, okay, it's it's like February, right? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? But Miami at at midday, whatever day it is, whatever month of the year it is, you'll get really badly burned. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're like pretty white, as mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. I if you don't take care. So I got <laughs> pretty badly sunburned. Uh, do you remember our opening prep though? I'm trying to remember. What did we do? We did watch some Hikaru. I, I remember Hikaru was just starting to stream and we were also um, following his his rise um, within the streamers world. We had a lot of fun. With I don't that. remember that at all. Yeah, yeah. I just I remember the opening that we prepared. I'm trying to actually... remember the openings. Okay, tell me. What did we prepare? It was actually openings? a beautifully concise repertoire, which um, basically was like, how do you prepare D4 in a week for white? Oh, I had this idea in, in the English, I remember. Yeah, yeah, you had this idea, which eventually was played against me by someone, uh, by Grishuk. I mean, he it was A3 in, in a reverse Sicilian line. Mm -hmm. It was like C4, E5. That's the only uh, thing I remember about the camp. Yeah. <laughs> G3, Knight F6, Bishop G2, C6, D4, E4, A3. Okay, this was a line. Mm -hmm. uh, which Grishuk eventually played against me and, and got a good position. But it was like, okay, how do you prepare D4 in a week? Like everything. And we found out that you can basically play queen B3 against everything. So you play the Catalan, D4, knight of six, C4, E6, knight of three, D5, G3. And then whether black plays bishop B7 now, or first gives a check on B4 and then moves a bishop on back to E7, you always put your queen on B3. Mm -hmm. Now I remember this, yes. And like looking back, it sounds extremely silly, but... I beat Wesley in the first round with this very stupid queen b3. I got a winning position against Ding. It somehow worked like more or less to perfection, this this kind of very half-assed prep, which also included queen b3 in the slop. Um, nobody played the slop, but it was like very amateurish prep if you look back on it. But somehow in 2018, it was good enough. And the rest was like uh, preparing the Petrov with black and the Vienna with black and... Openings more or less worked out in that tournament. I mean, 
I'm trying to uh, remember. Looking back, did it sounds use, stupid. Did you use the Vienna? Ah, yeah, you did use the Vienna. Uh, you you used yeah, it against Levon, right? I beat Levon, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it was the Vienna was solid. I lost in the pet drop to uh, uh, to uh, Sergey, obviously, pretty important game, but it wasn't uh, the end of the tournament, and somehow I won the tournament, so that that went well. And then 2020 was kind of more serious. That was actually like strong engines and real prep and real ideas and uh, actually used many of the ideas in the tournament. Some are even relevant to this day. Mm -hmm. And okay, last candidates uh, prep was pretty serious, but play wasn't so good. So it didn't work out. But yeah. the prep did over time get more serious. And now we're in a totally different era of uh, of prep, and we'll see how how that works out as well. How do you, how do you handle um, the different personalities within a team? Yeah, it's interesting. So I've worked with with many people, um, and it's not so much about their chest strength because everyone has a different personality. And some people have very strong personalities, like they they're stubborn. They're they might even have like a dominating personality. You might say right mm -hmm. that they they won't back down because there's always going to be some like either chess disputes or some other disputes. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who are very easygoing and they, they don't, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say they have like not strong personalities, but they don't let their personality dominate uh, a relationship mm -hmm. or however you want to put it. They're mm -hmm. kind of more flexible, which is obviously better when uh, in terms of working together with someone, as long as they're not like wishy-washy and they don't give their opinion or they're, they're scared. Um, in terms of like people with strong personalities, actually most most chess players are pretty stubborn. Are, um, yes. But some are a bit more low key. Like I worked with Mickey, for example, very mellow guy, very easygoing. Uh, like he's, uh, I mean, he he's uh, obviously going to give his opinions about chess and and give like very worthwhile feedback and so on, but. You're, it's unlikely that you're going to get into a conflict with Mickey. Mm -hmm. And okay, I had obviously a long-term uh, work relationship with Rustam, so that was many, many years. So obviously that was um, uh, complicated at times and, and good at times, obviously. And we worked together quite quite a bit as well. Worked with Lenier, for example, also similar to Mickey in some ways, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mellow, kind of chill, relaxed personality. Yeah, very strong uh, player, very uh, very strong analytical force, but like, again, as you were mentioning, very very mellow as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's some people. I, I like. I don't want to to say too much about people. Obviously, it's like mm -hmm. personal stuff. Very often uh, about how they are, but but in general, most chess players I've worked with, yeah, pretty easy going. Mm -hmm. um, some are like very entertaining, like we mentioned Lawrence, obviously <laughs> very entertaining guy. Uh, so if you want like a fun personality around, that's you, you could also look for that. That's that's always a good thing to have someone who will like lighten the mood a bit. Uh, and yeah, it's interesting. Of course, you you have to manage people sometimes. You definitely, uh, which do. is not my not my forte. But. But people want direction, so it's not like you just say, "Okay, go be free." And <laughs> I, I, I generally you think you're 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 pretty good at managing people, especially like after a while, um, after a while of working with them, because you have like a quiet, let's say, leader's perspective. You know, not not like a you know a super uh, boisterous leader or anything of that nature. But people generally follow your lead. I would say especially once they get to work with you a little bit yeah the more you work with someone usually the the easier it gets to um to find a rhythm if, if you want to put it like that yeah yeah no i've i've had a lot of fun um during the camp i was a little bit sick that was the problem and you know you obviously have to manage these type of situations as well because oftentimes somebody uh, let's say you have four or five guys on a team. Somebody's going to get sick at one point. It was the case in Miami right now. Um, I got sick and I wasn't able to work out for a few days. Um, but you guys kept going. We're not going to mention names of who was there, maybe after the candidates. But um, you guys kept going and I rejoined, let's say, uh, during the last five days or so. So 
um, I think overall it it went well. Yeah, getting sick is unfortunate. I, like I was also worried I was getting sick at some point, but mm -hmm. somehow avoided it. So immunity stayed strong and avoided whatever. There well, was definitely sort of like... something running around. There was definitely something yeah. running around, for sure. Well, it's also um, that sort of season, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's a, the weather is a bit colder. People are going to be more inside, and and maybe their immunity will be down a bit, and they'll they're more likely to catch something. Yeah, uh, Hikaru was saying at some point that he's not getting ready for the candidates. I think. I'm not really sure if he mentioned it on his stream, but I've heard about it. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, we, we <laughs> because right now, you know, we're saying something and then people are saying that they never said that particular thing. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to get into that territory too much. But there's nothing to get in. Like, okay, if, if, I'm, if I see something online, <laughs> uh, someone says something publicly, uh, then I'm and I say it. I mean, there's there's not really much to say. Like, what do you say publicly? You have to to think about what it's what's your what's being said. But like, people will obviously notice that you said it mm -hmm. if you say mm -hmm. it. I mean, like, we're obviously talking about the um, the Hans post, right, mm -hmm. on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, I, I had this moment of like, did did I really, hear, I, I was sure I heard it. It was like very vivid memory, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it was like, okay, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't save the, the video, um, but I, I was pretty sure I remembered it. Uh, of course, it's not like, it's not like he said something, which is some. No, like it's, it's, it's a minor thing. I mean, it, it can happen, a slip of the tongue. Yeah, it, it can always happen. Yeah. yeah, of course. It was like, to me, it was just funny. Like, okay. I mean, he said he's going to be the first American world champion. Obviously, it's funny because it's uh, it can't be the case. And if it's meant as a joke, it's also funny. And I mean, if if you say a joke and people repeat it, it's like, isn't that the whole point? Um, like, you can say we're laughing with him in that case. Uh, but I, I'm I wasn't trying to to be mean spirited and repeating that he said it. It's like I don't I don't judge you based on some. A uh, small thing that you said, which wasn't entirely true, mm -hmm. or I mean, okay, in this case, obviously not at all true, um, but it it just seems sort of funny because it was like there was this uh, obviously ongoing um, beef, you can call it, with uh, Hans and with Hikaru, because of, okay, there was a lawsuit and all that. So, uh, and then he he made uh, a comment, basically saying that he's going to be the one who popularizes chess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it just sounded it sounded pretty funny and i remember watching it because it was like one of hans uh hans's coming back streams Come back streams the, yeah the, the um what do you want to call it the hiatus re reconciliation between yes. all the parties if you want to call it that mm -hmm. and okay i was i was watching i forget which tournament it was some some online event could be any, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a million of these events. And yeah, it was just funny. <laughs> but then to claim that you didn't say it, it's like, okay, if it's if it's on video, probably it's uh, someone's going to, to remember it, right? Uh, so anyway. No, that's... it's funny because, I, I mean, he, he was giving me a hard time during Mexico as well when we were chatting in Mexico and he was really telling me that, yeah, it's, I, I never said that, you know, I never said that. And then, you know, the clip resurfaces and... Um... Maybe he just simply didn't remember uh, saying it, and uh, you know, uh, I'll give it to him. Maybe he just doesn't want people to have that impression of him. Um, different people have, uh, you know, uh, different understanding of how others will interpret what they say. So if that's his choice, that's his choice. But yeah. He definitely okay, but said it's it. like it's a, it's a non-issue, no? <laughs> definitely. Mean... Yes, that's the thing. But some people, a... you know, perceive it differently. I guess it's what I'm getting at. Yeah, sure. But I mean, like I've said a, a million stupid things in my life. So have you? Yes. I, I assume, and yes, so yes. has everyone. Yes. And uh, and so yeah, you say something like mildly stupid, you can kind of poke fun at yourself for it. You're like, oh yeah, of course I. I, I'm going to be the first American world champion. I'm going to go back in time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can just make it a funny thing and kind of keep it lighthearted. There's no reason to uh, to double down. But okay, whatever. 
yeah uh, that that's basically I, I don't take it too seriously to be honest yeah yeah uh yeah uh, so i think hikaru was the one that mentioned he's not going to uh, get ready as much for the candidates and i think he mentioned why as well mostly because you know he previously was taking it very seriously doing a lot of camps doing a lot of trainings and then things weren't working out during the actual event and then when he didn't take it as seriously things did work out so you know different styles i guess in preparation as well i think Vid vidit just recently had an interview let's say with anish they let anish ask vidit a couple of questions during tata steel and he did say that he hasn't started his camp yet um and he doesn't know exactly who he's uh, trainers will be but I guess that's normal is only January he has a big event obviously Tato Steel and probably immediately after he's done with it he's going to go um, get ready for the candidates yeah everyone will do whatever work they feel is necessary mm -hmm. I mean we all have our own process yeah so it's it's not like you know you you work super hard to guarantee something and it's not like you you don't work at all and uh, and it means that you're doomed it just it's probably overall for most people a benefit to uh, put some effort into training before. And that's what most people, pretty much all chess players will uh, will go for. But it's interesting, right? Stuff. Because every single other sport, at least, you know, let's say basketball, it, it, there's a very standardized way in which you prepare. You just show up in the gym, you do your drills, and then you go back home and then you repeat that every single day. Um, I don't think there's anything super particular that you do in preparation for, let's say, the Olympia. You know, like what is the U.S. team doing differently than what they're doing whenever they're uh, practicing with their NBA squads? Like it, it seems there's a standardized model of training. And in chess, I don't know if we have that. Do we have that? Okay, you can say that most people will do something similar. So like what you see at the Magnus camp mm -hmm. will look very much like what we do. Sure. With some differences, some minor differences, but more or less you're getting the same sort of... And and Jan will do the same thing, right? It's you invite a bunch of people and you look at yeah. chess. Uh, the thing is that, of course, when it comes to like basketball or any of these big sports with a lot of money, uh, it's very much down to a science. Like there's a lot of money and research that goes into it. And in terms of chess, most players don't make much money and don't have the means to invest. Uh, like I have to say, the camp that I organize is is very expensive. It's mm -hmm. tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So um, most players don't have this money to throw at, at training. And uh, when it comes to, of course, other sports, we're not talking about tens of thousands. We're probably talking about, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, you, you have a chef and you have... Uh, a personal masseur or masseuse <laughs> and, uh, and you have a nutritionist and you have a psychologist and millions of dollars you have a chiropractor and then you have uh you go to sauna and it's like every day every part of the day is regimented and um and every like they throw who, who knows how much money right at every single athlete mm -hmm. um so it's just the, the money is different so the level of professionalism will be different do you think that but, we can increase let's say the level of productivity uh through that through more resources in chess and in chess training specifically well it's it's an individual thing of course every player can but when it comes to like um like basketball right it's the team who is going to invest all this money into their players yeah but when it comes to chess we don't really have teams so much we have individual players team events usually have no money and limited funding like okay the biggest one is the olympiad but most players who go to the olympiad to play for their country get paid absolutely zero or very close to it and even the big teams like the american team uh gets paid like a fraction of what i get paid for normal tournaments mm -hmm. so i'm mostly going there to represent my country not to get paid i mean i think our when we won the gold medal our bonus was like three thousand bucks uh, that was to win. That was the, <laughs> that's that's a bit rough. <laughs> I'm not gonna so, lie. Okay. So of course, some some countries have have bigger rewards. Uh, I think Armenia like, has like thirty thousand, or at least that's those yeah. were let's say the speculations back then. Sure, and <clears throat> like Uzbekistan, we heard that they got paid quite a bit for winning. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about most most countries, like 
I don't know, the, the German team, for example, what do they get paid? Probably, probably very minimally. I remember yeah. what Italy was paying. It was, it was nothing, I mean, um, to play for the team. And okay. So, so obviously there's no like big infrastructure. So it's very much up to individual players. Now, if you have a, a lot of money to invest, like let's say you're Magnus, Hikaru, you can, you can spend a lot of money because you have it. Then I'd say it's probably worth it. It's probably a good investment. And also there's probably a lot of things that you can do to give yourself a little bit of extra edge, especially a, a physical edge, mm -hmm. like uh, investing in nutrition, investing in exercise, investing in, um, let's say, uh, different sports routines, whatever, uh, whatever might be beneficial. I think that that's... But it's always going to be at the very, very top level because we're not we're not like tennis players. We don't yeah. get sixty million a year in endorsements. So yeah. It's you know chess players, the top ones get a few hundred grand a year. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, most are 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 making an average living or or below average, and then Magnus will make, um, you know, over a million, mm -hmm. and Hikaru makes most of his money from streaming so you can't even say that it's it's just like a special case yeah he's not doing it from chess playing let's say he's doing it from chess yeah, other you know, he makes good money from chess playing right he probably made last year like uh half a million from prizes maybe I, sure. I don't know exactly um but which is very good of course but most of his money will be from streaming yeah 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 no no that uh makes a lot of sense and i mean e even for you and i don't necessarily want to speak for you but you only have training camps for candidates and world championship matches right I mean, anything else you're doing camps for i had one before the world cup but it was only about six days long okay and the uh, world cup which is a qualifying event for yeah. the candidates well i really wanted to qualify for the candidates yeah I, I would usually i wouldn't even do anything before the world cup but i was like okay we need to get we need to amp up the training a little bit and um this is a big event it ended up being working worth it, out right it was an yeah. investment yeah so i worked with two guys one week yeah but less than one week i guess actually the camp ended up being a disaster for totally um uncontrollable reasons yeah. I, I got a really serious infection uh on my arm i had never had this before my arm my uh, my elbow balloon ballooned up for like the next month it was incredibly painful I don't some some sort of infection right and um and i didn't want to take antibiotics because i think that antibiotics really mess with you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, like mess, mess with your body so so i was just kind of sitting there in pain and eventually like trying to to alleviate it with like hot hot packs like hot towels and stuff and anyway that's not, not and really i think that's actually kind of unpleasant for a chess player because you're posting up on your elbows whenever you're thinking about the position. I mean, how, how oh, do you, I, I couldn't do that. How I do couldn't you do that for think? Two months. Yeah, I couldn't touch that that elbow for two months. Yes. It was uh, it was really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's crazy. But in the end, everything worked out uh, just fine. Cool. All right, let's get back to reality. Let's get back to the present day. We have the Tata Steel tournament. Anish stealing pawns. Anish taking my job as an interviewer as well. A lot of things are happening. And of course, Hans is uh, in the mix as well in the challengers group. So let's talk about that. First time um, in a long time, I guess, in a big tournament in which uh, both world champions, uh, the women's world champion and the uh, open world champion are playing in the same event, Joan Jun and Ding Li Ren. What's your take on that? How do you gauge uh, Juwan Jun's performance uh, up to this point? Is she rising to the expectations? Uh, okay, so so let's see the standard. So um, so far, it's after ten rounds. So they have four, uh, three more left. Yes. Nurbek and Gukesh tied for the lead. Yes. With plus three, is that? I think I'm reading that correctly. Six and a half out of how many rounds so far? So that's plus three. Plus three out of ten, I guess. Yeah. And um, yeah, Wen Jun, so obviously women's world champion. Uh, she she beat Fruja in this tournament. Probably mm -hmm. her biggest win, I would say. 
yeah in her career highest rated by at least if uh if we're measuring it by rating and uh she's currently on four out of ten so okay she's she's the world champion right minus um, two yeah that's not that bad not a, actually she's not a new name it's a, like we we know that she's very strong uh she's even been quite significantly higher rated than she is now i would say she's, she's very around. underrated right now well yeah, there is this whole like deflation thing so it's hard to judge right because everyone's going down and it seems like the whole kind of chess eco system has gone down in rating mm -hmm. but uh she was at some point i think like 26 10 yep. around there and now she's 25 49. okay so big win against perugia i think that she could have today she could have maybe beaten parham she was kind of close but okay it ended in a draw uh, so overall, it's it's pretty good. Like she's obviously going to struggle in this field. I mean, she's she's very much lower rated than most players. Um, she's only like kind of close to let's say Max Warmerdam, mm -hmm. but but many players she's around two hundred points lower rated. So she's going to struggle. But minus two is not like a huge struggle. It's it's a respectable result. It's also the same exact result that Ding Liren has. Yep. And Max warmer down. So she's I and I think she's gaining some rating points. So definitely overperforming um for her rating in, in this one. Okay, but but Max, I mean if if we're being oh, honest man. here, the <laughs> the guy is probably um very upset with his result. Oh my because goodness. if we just re rewind like twenty six hours, I don't know <laughs> yeah. exactly how many hours, but let's say twenty six. Yeah. He was on 50 percent and he was absolutely about to beat parham mm -hmm. so that would have put him plus one a half point out of the lead and he lost that game because he he blundered rook c8 i assume and it went from basically winning to losing within the span of two moves so that was kind of tragic mm -hmm. and then today the exact same story repeated uh he was totally beating noterbeck and if he had won, he would be back on 50%, but he lost both of those games for winning positions. If he had won both, he would be like half a point out of the lead, mm -hmm. tied with Anish, tied with Prague. And instead, he's minus two and he's uh, he's near the bottom. Yeah. So that just shows how, uh, how fine the line is between a good tournament and a disappointing one. No, absolutely. And he's actually been playing great chess. I mean, obviously he's done a lot of preparation for uh, this event but it's those slim margins that always make um, a huge difference whether you have a good or a bad tournament and uh, things are just simply not going his way in this one but uh definitely nodir beck is showing that uh, last year's performance was not a fluke um he almost won it last year lost it in the last round he was definitely uh, primed to win the event but right now once again back in um, not sole position because Gukesh is also doing amazing but tied for first with Gukesh six and a half out of uh, ten so both of these youngsters Honestly, having amazing Oderbeck tournaments has, has a much easier finish okay so he's finishing up the with what uh they did it Okay, obviously, Vid is a top player. Ju -Wen -Jun. But he's played Wen Jun and Donchenko. Yes. So two of the lower rated players in the tournament. Yes. And Gukesh is playing uh, Prague, I mm -hmm. think, and uh, Ali Reza and Parham. So t three of the higher rated players in the tournament. Yes. So, and okay, there's some guys who have a chance as well. Prague, very solid. He's playing Gukesh. He's playing Ali Reza and he's playing Donchenko. So okay, he has he has a shot. Anish uh, playing uh, Warmerdam, Max, mm -hmm. and Jordan. Okay, Jordan is struggling. And Jan. Okay, it's 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 still a wide open race, but I, of course I would, if we probably look at the stats, Noterbeck should have some sort of decent chance of winning. Yeah. And and some of the other players also have a decent chance, but probably that everyone. Who is, who is below Prague and Anish? They're at six points plus two. Doesn't really have much of a chance. I mean, five and a half, one point gap with three rounds to go. Probably not going to really cut it, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this this group includes like Jan, 
plus one, Ali Reza plus one, Wei Yi plus one, so on and so forth. Yeah, no, but uh, obviously looking at the standings, uh, I don't know when it happened, but I can easily say right now that these guys more or less uh, stabilized, let's say, uh, their uh, presence in the top, uh, cemented their presence in the top. Nodribek, Gukesh, uh, Prague as well all of these youngsters that not long time ago um in fact probably when we first started the podcast which was a little bit over a year we were talking about okay who's going to be the next big thing it seems like all of them are uh the next big thing they're definitely making their way to cement themselves into the new generation of elite level players would you say so yeah i think i mean it's it's pretty clear that they're very strong yeah and if they're a bit behind some of the more well-established players, it's only by a tiny bit. Yeah. It's definitely not a clear margin. And but Noderbeck, they're here to play. stay. Yeah, of course. Noderbeck, Gukesh, Prague, these will definitely be top players for a long time to come. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, we can talk about other young players, but we've we've uh, already talked about them very often, right? I mean, we... <laughs> Yeah. We talked about the Indian um, juniors. We talked about Ali Reza many times, uh, about Noderbeck, and about even some of the younger guys. But yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there's no... I mean, it was already clear, but there, there's not really much of a doubt. And if you look at the ratings, like Prague is 27.49, and Giri is 27.55, Ali Reza is 27.56. Wesley's 27.57. It's not much of a difference. Nope. Not at all. Uh, Noderbeck is 27.43. Very close. Yeah. Yeah. No. So who's uh, who would you say out of the candidates right now is making uh, the strongest impression uh, in Tata Steel? But, but does it, I mean, does it really matter? Because uh, when I won the candidates in 2018, I had a miserable Tata, like minus three. Terrible, yeah. When, when Karyakin won the candidates in 2016, he had a miserable Tata. I, I don't know exactly, with minus three or minus four. And when Jan won in 2022, he had a miserable um, Bucharest tournament, minus one or minus two, I forget. And so it's like, it's a whole different, I mean, the, the slate is wiped clean. It's all new. Even when I mean, Ding, won- last year, right? Ding didn't have a great, Tata Steel, and then went on to win the World Championship, the candidates and the World Championship match. Not the candidates. <laughs> okay, <Ding. laughs> yeah, Ding, I, I mean, looking at Ding's chess in this tournament, it, it's obviously something's not quite right with his with his play. Yeah. Um, he, he plays at a, at a level that is far below what I'm used to seeing from him. And he has for, for quite a while, to be honest. Like, yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I hope he recovers at some point. But this tournament is not looking very good for him. He's minus two. Uh, his play today was was not good. Uh, he he won one good game against Gukesh. But besides that, it's actually been like all either uninspiring or just bad games. Yeah, an uninspiring. I think it's 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 a good word for it. Um, I don't know. It it doesn't feel like he plays a tenacious uh, brand of chess. Uh, The type of chess that we've seen from him very, very often. Um, Whenever he's at his best, he's very, very tenacious. I just simply don't see that with Ding right now. Um, uh, But, you know, I mean, all of these things can happen. People can have, you know, uh, difficult periods of time in their respective careers. But, um, yeah, we're hoping to see Ding maybe play a little bit more, you know, because he hasn't been playing a lot. Um, I don't know if you can expect to just come back, play one, two tournaments per year, and then just do amazing in those one, two tournaments that you're playing. It just doesn't happen that way. And it seems to be the case with Ding uh, at the moment. But I, I have to say, like, ever since 2019, I actually consider, like, his play to have dropped off very significantly. Mm. This is purely not from a results point of view. Um just like looking at his actual games very often. Uh, he, like in 2019, I feel like he was incredibly, incredibly strong. Yeah. Uh, and and he won the Grand Chess Tour. And okay, it wasn't like he was, um, uh, let's say, uh, head and shoulders above anyone else. 
but he was really strong at a period when it was pretty competitive. A lot of players were, were coming up. Mm -hmm. And that was the last time that I would say that he was like um, playing really strong brand of chess. Mm. Pr pretty much like he's, he's had some decent results. I mean, he did win a world championship match, but uh, I mean, if you look at the match, of course, it's it's clear that neither player was. And this is taking in like I, I've I understand the pressure that goes into it. This is taking into account the pressure and the stress and we can't understand how difficult it is. Uh, it's it's obviously more difficult well you can than, yeah yeah but still it's like um unless you're actually in there you can't really speak for the players yeah but you still expect them to maintain like a certain quality level even when the stress is high and if we look at what was it game 12 i think um this is like a quality quality level which of, of the match i mean of the thing young match this is a quality level which you can't really expect from a classical chess game between players of that level. It's just maybe it happens like one once in a blue moon, but uh, but that was kind of like shocking quality. Mm -hmm. And okay, sometimes I play really shockingly bad games too, so I, I know how it is. Yeah. But um, but actually, that game was pretty special <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of how bad it was. Yeah, yeah. Moving so, on to yeah, yeah. Mm, go yeah. ahead. No, it's it's just interesting. Um, because of course, uh, both of these players will have like very different emotions coming out of the match, right? Yan and, and Ding. Yeah. And and you would think that for Ding it would be like an inspiring moment, but it doesn't seem to have been like getting getting the ultimate title in chess. Absolutely. It doesn't seem like it inspired him. Yeah. No. No. And I mean, it's a very good point because generally. Magnus, for example, after a world championship match, he generally plays very, very well in the ensuing months. Combination of obvious confidence uh, boosting and then also the preparation that he has from that match. It doesn't seem to be happening with uh, Ding right now. Jan, on the other hand, as we've seen even today against Ding, he had some residual ideas, it seems like, from the match this g4 in the game that i think they played in their last game during the world championship match um in the same line the same variation so um definitely showing something some moments of inspiration Jan. that is okay let's move on to the challengers um in which i have to say surprisingly it's uh mark andrea maurizzi um, one of the, let's say, lower rated players in the event, 2572 going into this one, who's for the moment dominating. I think he has plus five, lost game, one six, and um, he's been on fire. The world junior champion, only 16 years of age, very promising player from France. What's your take on him? Have you been following his games? And then um, we also got to talk about uh, what's happening with the other other players. The other players, <laughs> of course. Of course, you're referring to um, to all the players and not just. Any I'm, specific I'm, I'm referring players. to Liam Vroilik and Jamie well, actually, Santos it's... and one Hans Mok Niemann, of course. <laughs> no, I think okay. So it's definitely two players who can still win the tournament. Basically nobody else. I mean, it's like okay, Maurizi, Maurizi. good chance, mm -hmm. best chance, one point in the lead, Maybe. one point ahead in the lead. And Danka has a chance, but okay, it's a one point deficit, three rounds to go. But okay, you, you definitely can bridge that gap. Things can happen. And besides that, probably nobody else is catching Maurizi, so it's between those two players. I don't yeah. think anyone else is going to make it. Yeah. I mean, you could you could say maybe one and a half points. It's possible. If things go really well, you win three games in a row. It, things could happen, but it's not so likely. Yeah, and Maurizio yeah, has what Daniel Darda to play, Irvin, Irvin Lamy, and um, uh, Liam uh, Vroilik. Actually, so. maybe a more difficult finish than like Mendonca has. Mendonca has uh, Salem. Hard to say. Actually. Hard to say. Mustafa Ilmaz, who was very close to winning it last year, but this year he's just simply having a disastrous tournament. 
and uh, Divya Deshmukh, um, who obviously, you know, uh, wasn't one of the rating favorites. Uh, he was actually, she was actually at uh, the bottom of uh, the rating totem pole, 24-20, but she's been winning some very cool games, actually. I remember that game. I think she beat Korobov, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, she's... Very nice fashion. Oh, I, think, I think Divya lost to Korobov. Did but, she? Um, she beat somebody she, in a very aggressive fashion. I'm trying to remember she exactly beat who. Santos Latasa. Ah, yes, you're right. Santos. Mm -hmm. Okay, she, she's a very good um, junior player. She's like, I, I don't know exactly, 18, I think. 18, 24, um, 20. Very promising player. Very talented. Um, attacking, I remember like player. a few years ago, I was kind of, um, I think it was like the, what was the tournament? The Grand Swiss in Riga. So we were kind of locked in, but at some point, Surya Ganguly, mm -hmm. he's uh, he's trying to organize some like board games and card games. Yeah, and so he invited me, and I ended up playing card games with like all the Indian kids. Okay, uh, it was like Avalon, and, and the, I think it was only Avalon we played. Yeah, and uh, and all of these like young talented Indian kids were there. Divya was was among them, and uh, and like now now some of them are top players, right? <laughs> so yeah, back then they weren't quite top players yet they were st they were still kind of uh trying to climb up the ranks but uh yeah kids like like Prague and, and so on and um yeah they're all they're all very talented for sure so so yeah she's good um Eileen Rovers is also okay she's she's struggling but uh she did win two games in a row against top top seeds in the tournament and yeah, she um, beat Hans and Mustafa. Yeah, back, back to, to back. back. But since then, it's it's been a bit downhill. So she she lost a few games. Yeah. And um, yeah, what else? Um, I I mean, it's an interesting tournament. I'm not following it as closely as the Masters group, but still following the games. And um, I mean, okay, Maurizio, he's uh, he's a world junior champion, right? So he's he is, yeah, yeah. He's an interesting, he's a known, interesting he's a known talent already. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to see how this guy uh, develops. He he doesn't seem to um, be afraid of anybody. Like he he plays very aggressively. He plays very precise for the most part, and it doesn't seem like tension gets to him as easily. At the same time, and I think we were discussing it. Uh, when we were discussing the Grand Suisse as well from this year, he can be on and off, as you know, you would expect from a 16-year-old, but definitely a promising talent from from France. Um, and of course, Hans. Okay, Hans, five and a half plus one right now. Um, just announced that I think he's not going to lose any any more games. I think this was uh, his uh, recent announcement. He announces a lot of things, but his most recent announcement is that. He's done losing, not going to lose any more games. That's a good announcement. Yeah. <laughs> Can, See how you, it works out for you. Do you dare to, to announce that you're never going to lose any games anymore? No, I, I know I'll lose games. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I I actually don't like, t I'm, I'm not good at not losing games, but I, I do actually have a style that like leads to a lot of wins and losses. Um. <laughs> Which is overall maybe not such a bad thing. No, uh, and that's actually what he said during his first social media on Substack, first post. He was like, yeah, uh, basically, uh, there to win, there to lose, uh, more or less. So, you know, he's, he's very inspirational right now. Hans uh, has a new growing YouTube channel, YouTube presence. Um, so it should be interesting to see how the next few tournaments develop for him as well. Yeah, we'll see. Cool, cool. All right. What else uh, should we be chatting about? Um, <laughs> well, we should definitely chat about uh, another up-and-coming YouTuber, um, Vladimir Kramnik. He started his um, Title Tuesday career. Um, been playing and streaming and speaking with the chat, engaging with the chat. And obviously accusing a lot of people of unruly things. Um, what's our opinion on that? You actually just recently had a launched episode um, on a different podcast. And you said that you're generally playing two cheaters on average per title Tuesday. 
I feel Vladimir yeah. probably thinks he's way higher than that. What do we think of that? What's 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 there to say? What's there more to say about what you know uh, this crusade that that Vladimir is engaged in? Maybe you know for for a good cause. Okay, so it's um, anyway. This is a cheating discussion. This is not a Kramnik discussion, right? Yeah. So because of course what Kramnik's actual blitz games and, and his tournament, it's not particularly interesting with all due respect. Um, I mean, he's he's a good player. He okay. He was one of the greatest uh, of all time. Now he's just a good player, with all due respect. Again, yeah. Uh, and in terms of online chess, of course, he's not that impressive with the mouse, if we're being honest. Right. Put it mildly. Right. Uh, mechanical. But he is still a mechanical good player. issues. Yes. Yeah. So if we're talking about cheating in general, I don't think I'm I'm going to draw too many conclusions from. Like the tournaments that um, that Kramnik is playing, I I've, I haven't watched his game so much. Um, I can tell you, and I've I've said this many times, <laughs> that cheating is a serious problem. Yeah, and um, yeah, we can of course get. I mean, into we all played we all played uh, Title Tuesday um, during the camp, and I I don't play this very often, just for the simple fact that you know I don't see myself uh, having huge chances of winning a prize and i have better things to do for the most part for the most part uh but we did play all of us and i did feel that my first game was very 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 suspicious um okay i won i i played a few more games after that and then decided to withdraw but the first game was extremely extremely suspicious i was already you know feeling like i'm joining the kramnik camp and i'm ready to make some public announcements but <laughs> well what i've absolutely noticed among uh active chess players who i've spoken to with an absolute a hundred percent um accuracy every single one of them thinks cheating is a serious issue i haven't spoken to a single one uh and i can just like rattle off names but i don't think it's necessary mm -hmm. i'm talking about the best players in the world i'm also talking about grandmasters who are like 2650 grandmasters who are 2600 uh players who aren't so active um but still play every once in a while online everyone i've spoken to thinks that cheating is a serious issue and the extent of the cheating issue varies now I, i'm just explaining this for the people who aren't professional players so people who are watching this most people won't be in the chess scene as a player right they'll just mm -hmm, be mm -hmm. uh chess enthusiasts and so on so I promise you, you might think Kramnik's paranoid, I'm paranoid, or whatever. And uh, and definitely many people rightly consider Kramnik's um, methodology, if you want to call it methodology, to be completely wrong, which I think is also correct. Like The numbers that he's looking at are, are not really relevant, so he's right in principle. But it's not just Kramnik. It's not just, uh, okay, Maxime had a podcast with Kramnik. I, I can tell you that Maxime also... Um, will 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 publicly say that cheating is a big issue, mm -hmm. and it's not just Maxime. It is uh, other players, and it's not just Magnus, uh, and it's not just um, concerns about certain players. It's it's actually very widespread concern about many players, and um, and none of it is provable because we can't know for sure. And if I were to cheat tomorrow, you would never know for sure. Yeah. And even the players who have been banned, very often they argue their case or they say they haven't cheated. And very often we don't even know who's been banned because uh, it's never or almost never made public. Uh, it's never public information. Mm -hmm. The only case that was like made public really was the case that, I mean, okay, we, we obviously we know, right, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like one case out of... Uh, out of hundreds, right, of people who are actually caught and banned and then maybe argue their case or maybe they admit to it. And um, and we're not talking about, let's say, a limit that stops at a certain rating like 2600. No, we're talking about above 2600. And we're, it also doesn't stop at 2700. We're talking above 2700. And the question is, does it stop above 2750? And I'm actually not sure that it does mm -hmm. uh, stop above 2750. And uh, it has nothing to do with elitism because I, I think... That um, uh, although cheating is more noticeable if you see a difference in results, like let's say if a 2400 suddenly starts playing like a 2700, 
that doesn't mean that uh, a 27 plus 100 player who suddenly becomes a 27 20 player we don't actually know for sure if that it's just harder to detect it's harder to notice because the skill level is higher at the start but that doesn't mean that those players should be immune from suspicion and um and there's many other things i, I think the main thing is the the difficulty in actually um using any sort of like statistics to reach a conclusion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other problem is that how can you really protect against it i mean you have to well you can't catch someone red-handed i mean unless they're a complete idiot right mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they it happened on camera. <laughs> it happened <laughs> so sure um, it it could happen um yeah, yeah. but for the most part people are not going to cheat in a way that you'll actually catch them red-handed online so you have to decide based on what that's actually for me the biggest question for Kramnik, he decided that it's based on chess.com accuracy scores. So I think that that's honestly bogus. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's not a good metric. Actually, he loses. people will say in in a lot of people's eyes, he loses credibility because he uses that metric so uh, so dominantly, which is probably not a great metric. And I don't think that it means anything. I can show you like some of my games, and ask you if the chess.com accuracy meant anything in this game. Uh, but then the question is, okay, what do you use? Uh, we don't know what chess.com uses because obviously their um, their algorithm or whatever is is a secret. Yeah. And uh, so, do we use uh, results? Like, if someone is playing badly over the board but playing really well online, do we use that? Because if we use that, then some people like really do come to mind. Uh, do we use the amount of money that people have won? Because if we use that, then obviously top players are the ones who have won most of the money. But you can also see people who have won like zero dollars over the board, but who have won pretty substantial amounts, maybe 50,000 plus over the years in uh, chess.com events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, people were like shocked by my like, some players have won hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, uh, there's actually like many players who have yeah so um again i'm not saying that like i i've won hundreds of thousands of dollars on chess.com but there, there's serious money involved so if someone's cheating and i really doubt that all the players who have won significant amounts of money have always done so fairly i'm pretty sure that's not the case yeah of course without proof so i'm not i can't i can't prove that this is the case but nobody can uh, and the other question is like it's not my responsibility to ban or not ban someone. Yeah. But chess.com or Lee Chess or whatever has to decide what their um, percentage threshold, of certainty. Is. I guess. Yeah. yeah. What their threshold is. Threshold of banning people. Yeah. Yeah. Like no. how sure do they have to be? Um, like Kremnik will tell you maybe it's ninety percent. For me, this seems kind of uh, not certain enough, right? Because uh, we might getting be getting into territory where you know, some some players get banned without without reason, but they're also very strong players, and it's their living. And um, I think the difference with like, okay, so once we spoke to Vladimir, and he mentioned the parallel between chess cheating as a crime and like real world crime. The difference is that when uh, when you have a real world crime, you need some sort of um, physical evidence usually. Right, like you're not you're not deciding based on, um, yeah, numbers on a screen, like yeah. how accurately yeah. someone played, yeah, how well someone played in the game. It's like okay, the person was in this location, they, you know, uh, their fingerprints were there, or someone saw them, or okay, now we're just talking about different things, right? Beyond um, reasonable doubt, yes, I guess. Yeah, or, or something like something tangible. Like when it comes to online chess, what what are we? It's so difficult. I can't even imagine. I mean, what is the um, reasonable doubt? I guess in 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 this instance. Um, well, I don't think you can base it off moves because some like if I want to cheat, I can cheat by playing like shit mm -hmm. uh, and win, mm -hmm. or I can play a really really good game and not be cheating, like really accurate. Yeah. Um, I think the thing is that. When you cheat, you can also control the um, you can control the direction of the game. Yeah. So you can put 
you can make the position such that it's super, super complicated so that mistakes are likely to happen. And then you can just like start making mistakes yourself and your opponent's making blunders and you're making blunders. And at some point you just capitalize on a blunder and you win. Mm -hmm. Or you could just do it um, by like just playing yourself for the most part, but you play very, very quickly because you know that if you get in trouble, you can always bail yourself out. Uh, you can also decide that you only want to cheat, you know, uh, one game every two title Tuesdays. It will increase your results just a tiny bit, mm -hmm. but it will make a, a strong player a very strong player, and it will make a very strong player a an elite player, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, you can also say that you'll only cheat um, in two games every title Tuesday, and you'll only consult the engine uh, twice in those two games at random moments. It's going to increase your results somewhat. It is cheating, but how will you possibly be able to know? Yeah. And you I want, mean, there's just like a million ways we want, can't, we don't even know. understand how. So for me, the most important thing to, for people to understand is that chess players are, are just humans and, uh, and they're going to be tempted like anyone else. If, if I leave my door to my house open and I leave on a vacation for a month, do I really expect that nobody is going to come and steal something? <laughs> well, if nobody knows that your door is open, then probably nobody's going to try it. Um, you have a high chance of nobody trying, trying. Well, it, I just mean, for if, the I, if fact I leave my don't know. door wide open, oh, that's over. Just yeah, open. that's over. Yeah, yeah. you, you no, go out for like an hour. We, bye bye. If we give opportunity to people, then in almost all cases, chess or non-chess, people will. Uh, some people, not all, not all people are going to take advantage, but some people will be tempted and will take advantage for their own benefit. Yes, yeah. And especially it would be very when it nice. comes to financial benefit, especially when it yeah. comes to one's, uh, you know, living uh, ability to put food on table. You know, people do all sorts of things for, um, for that. Uh, yeah, it would be very naive to assume that uh, that I ho host a chess tournament where cheating is both easy, uh, very low risk in terms of being caught, if you're smart, mm -hmm. and also financially rewarding, and that nobody will take advantage of it. And we have a tournament of, I don't know, 200 players, whatever it normally is. Um, I don't actually know the numbers of how many people play Title Tuesday. Let me, let me just check the last, the last one. Let's check. Yeah. Let's, let's see. Okay, I'm already... Uh, way past 200. Okay, way past 300. So now we're in 400s. Okay, 488 players. Let's say who... let's say an average of 400 on on the lower sure. ends. Most actually withdraw very quickly after they lose a few games. Yep. But yeah, let's say 400 players. And um, uh, so what what percentage do you think will cheat? I don't know. I mean, um, if we're not assuming that it's like really really blatant like 25 percent is really blatant uh i mean chess.com said three percent right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we also I, I would assume that they're going a bit low on that and even if we settle at like 10 percent, that's still a pretty good chance that you're going to face a cheater at some point in those 11 games yeah uh so okay i mean you can call it paranoia or, or like last tile tuesday i don't really um i don't have strong suspicions i played a cheater I, this was like two days ago. Yeah, but I, I do have like suspicions about one game, which I actually won. But I I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, I was playing someone like uh, who was absolutely just outplaying me so consistently, and then uh, just flagged. Yeah, but I don't um, know for sure. It's uh, so. So I I don't think that it's like I, I'm not always thinking that people are cheating, but sometimes I have a really weird feeling. Like some people they just crush me. Um, one player who hasn't played a single over the board game in 15 years just played first line to left, first move to last, the first line of the engine, and that player still plays. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Like to me, that's even that one game is just impossible. Like, yeah. okay, maybe Magnus does it. That but... doesn't happen. That simply doesn't happen. That, that, that so... actually doesn't happen, never happens. Especially for somebody that does sometimes happen, but but usually not from players who don't even play chess anymore. Yeah, 
Um, but okay, what, what can I say? I mean, if people want to think that it's all paranoia, of course, they're free to think so. It's a never-ending story, and I'm sure there is uh, plenty of chapters to come in it. Um, Fabi, it's been great catching up. Uh, I think it's time to call it a day. Um, yeah, um, you have some tournaments coming up, but I'm sure we'll chat about it in our next episodes. Guys, don't forget, if you're enjoying the content, if you're enjoying the episodes, the discussions, tell your friends, sub to the channel, turn on the post notifications. That's going to let you know whenever we post uh, new episodes. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.